Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the How Good Innovation Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am really looking forward to our next hour of discussion. Um, as a way of introducing one another, if our audience members would like to put their name, uh, where they're based, if you'd like, you can put your role or the company that you work for uh, into the chat. And that way we can get to know each other a little bit, even though we won't have the opportunity to introduce ourselves uh, to one another. My name is Leah Wolf. I'm currently in Golden, Colorado, and I'm the head of regenerative education and content here at How Good. I am so excited to be speaking with two leaders in impact labeling today. Um, we're going to be talking about how brands can use the power of consumer communications and storytelling to contextualize carbon and eco labels, maximize sustainable impact, and meet ESG goals. So, joining us today, I'm so excited to introduce Elizabeth Whitlow, who is the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance and Mary Linnell Simmons, who is the Director of Marketing and Ex External Relations for Fair Trade America. Um, just to run through a quick agenda for our time together today, we'll finish up our introduction. We'll have a 30 to 35 minute conversation with our panelists. Um, and then depending on time, we may have the opportunity for some community discussion and breakout rooms for five to 10 minutes. And finally, we'll come back for a Q&A with the speakers before we wrap up at the top of the hour. Um, so just a quick note, as we continue our discussion today, uh, I'd like to invite the audience members to put any questions or comments that they may have for the speakers into the chat, and I'll do my best to get to them and relay them to our panel. So with that, I would love to first say thank you so much to both Mary and Elizabeth for being here today. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to discuss uh, impact labeling with both of you. Um, if, you would, if you wouldn't mind just doing a quick introduction of yourselves, maybe one to two minutes, I'd love to hear kind of your journey and, and how you arrived in the sustainability and regenerative space. Um, maybe a little bit about your organization and, and a, a project that you're excited about working on right now. Um, Mary, if you if you are ready, do you wanna kick sure, us off? that sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, hi everybody, I'm Mary Linnell Simmons. I'm the Director of Marketing and External Relations at Fair Trade America, which is the US um, branch of Fair Trade International, the global certification system. Um, I've been in the organization a little over seven years now. Um, and I came to sustainability a, a little bit through a securitist route. Um, I lived and worked in the United Kingdom for a number of years at various nonprofits. Um, but what struck me about all the places I worked at is that they always served fair trade tea, coffee, and sugar in their cafes. Um, and they always made a point about that. And I thought that that was really interesting because at that time um, in the United States, fair trade hadn't really taken off quite as much. Um, so when I moved back home, obviously I don't sound like I'm from there, when I moved back home, um, I was looking around uh, the DC area where I live um, and I saw Fair Trade America was based here and I thought, huh, look more into the model. And what I really love about Fair Trade is that it's a perfect mixture of um, market-based solutions uh, for global problems. It's a nonprofit and it doesn't seek to just layer on a top of altruistic giving on top of bad practices, but actually change those bad practices um, so we can have more equality uh, around the world. So really loved that. And I've loved continuing to work with the organization to make trade fair. We work with about 2 million farmers and workers globally. Often the farmers and workers we work with are earning less than $2 a day. So it is definitely the most disadvantaged um, of producers out there. And in the United States, we work with businesses such as uh, large ones, such as Ben and Jerry's through to smaller ones, um, such as, let me think, uh, maybe Gallant uh, International, uh, a clothing company, um, to try and uh, certify their supply chain as ethically sourced. Um, we also try and spread the word through uh, to shoppers to try and understand what it means when you're buying a fair trade certified product and also why we feel like we need to exist in the world. And I'm just really happy to be here um, with you and with Elizabeth to talk about this and more. 
Thank you so much. We are thrilled to have you. Um, Elizabeth, I'd love to hear from you about, about your journey and, and a little bit more about the Regenerative Organic Alliance. Sure thing. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see people with your cameras on and see uh, um, some friends and friendly faces there. So, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so for me, my journey began uh, back in college. I was a pretty rabid environmentalist. And um, it's funny, I thought about it a bit when I was looking at the questions that we we're gonna be discussing today. I really cared a lot about recycling and consumer waste and nuclear waste and things like that. And so I was really driven by that, like looking more at life cycle analysis and like whether things were made of recycled content. And I um, found my way after college into um, agriculture. And then I really learned more about the power of agriculture to solve so many of our problems and um, kind of never looked back after I started working with farmers and in farming and um, got to start in grad school actually with coffee farmers in fair trade, shade grown, organic certification world. And so I learned a lot about that then as well. And it was very much early days of that where people really didn't recognize that, especially here in the US. Um, you know, fair trade was recognized more around the world. Nobody was talking about shade grown coffee and like the kind of agroecological systems of production around coffee. So that was a really exciting time for me. And um, I kind of kept working deeper into those supply chains and, and then landed on organic. And I spent much of my career working in organics. And I see some of the folks I worked with here on this call, also some longtime leaders and pioneers in organics in California. And learned so much from all those farmers and really I love the organic label and I think it's really important but I also could see some of the lapses and some of the things that the National Organic Program specifically didn't address here and so when the opportunity came up to serve as the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance I jumped all over it and was lucky enough to be selected for that position. It's been a, a very um, very busy few years of launching this new certification. And I'm really excited to share um, some of the highlights of what we've been doing and what we've learned and how we are um, really scaling this movement through the use of the Regenerative Organic Certified Claim. Our founders are um, some longtime heroes of mine, Patagonia Company, Dr. Bronner's, and the Rodale Institute, among many other nonprofits um, in this sector. So yeah, I'll keep it short and back to you and looking forward to learning from you today as well, Leah, so thanks. Well, thanks so much. And, and I know that all of us on this call are very grateful for all of the hard work and collaboration that both your organizations have put in over the years to um, moving toward a more equitable and regenerative food system. So I'm excited to talk a little bit more and dig, dig in a bit um, to some of the messaging that goes behind that. Um, I think the first question that I'd like to ask you both is um, maybe some of your, strategies when it comes to educate, educating consumers about sustainability and impact issues, specifically in relation to your certifications, because they are so nuanced, right? Like it is such a deep and complex um, problem and that you that your, both your organizations are trying to address. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about how you tackle uh, bringing consumers into the fold and kind of meeting them where they are based on their understanding. Sure, yeah. Mary. Go ahead, Mary. Sure, I can I can jump in here. Um, so we've done some research on this um, through the market research agency GlobeScan, and what we found is that overwhelmingly shoppers learn about fair trade in particular through uh, the product labels themselves. Um, and then you have a diminishing return in terms of like internet searches, TV, radio, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we've been working hard with the brands that we partner with to um, not only accurately describe um, their claims on their products, but in a more substantial way, shout out what they're trying to do. And I think as well, that's being more and more rewarded in the marketplace. I think that um, we could all agree that we've been seeing more brands uh, being more vocal about these types of commitments. A couple of brands that come to mind that we work with, for example, is Ben & Jerry's that I mentioned before. Very, very noisy brand. Um, sometimes you forget that they make ice cream um, with how they speak. Um, and more recently, we've been seeing uh, Tony's Chocolonely, which is a... Um, European chocolate brand that is 
really being vocal in the space and talking about child and slave labor in the cocoa industry, which is a difficult topic when you're trying to sell a chocolate bar. Um, something that Tony's does is they, they put this information on and inside their packaging and labels. Um, another brand that we work with called Divine Chocolate also puts information about where their cocoa comes from in their packaging and labels because they are part owned by the cocoa farmers themselves, which is a very unusual model for a chocolate company to have ownership from the farmers. So I think that uh, at the end of the day, product labeling and that uh, when that product gets into a consumer's hands is the most important way that they will learn because everybody wants to feel good about the choices that they're making and is that the point in which they're making a choice. Outside of that, you know, we work around the usual channels to try and get our information out there. And one of the ones that we've really found to be growing in the U.S. is just um, media in general. Um, more and more outlets are looking to cover a sustainability story, whether they are a sustainability focused outlet or not. I saw we have somebody on the call from Sustainable Brands, for example. They're always talking about this type of stuff. Um, but we've been seeing more interest in, you know, your usual outlets like Forbes, for example, wanting to tell the sustainability story and really dig into it. So we think that that will only grow. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there is some research required by shoppers um, when they're looking to go about their shopping. So another thing that we suggest is uh, to choose curated retailers to shoppers. So for example, um, we were one of the first certifications that launched with Amazon's Climate Pledge Friendly badging, um, which helps filter out uh, sustainable products of all different stripes. Um, but also we recommend that shoppers look into like Thrive Market, um, which is a more curated selection. And if you're talking about, you know, actually going into a store, which what is that these days? Um, we've done lots of partnership with like the National Co-op Grocers uh, Association, who might might run your local food co-op in your community. Um, so that's another great place where you can just know that someone has taken the time to look through the products that are being displayed and there's been some kind of filter. Absolutely. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to, would you like to add, I can remind you a little bit of the question as well, it, just talking about in terms of helping the average consumer sort of understand a very complex sustainability impact indicator and, and certification, um, which I know that surrounding regenerative as regenerative becomes more popular in, in just the sort of public discourse. Yeah. I think people have a better understanding, but I think there's still a lot of misunderstandings that happen there. So I'd be interested to hear how you, how you kind of communicate that to your consumer. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, we're really just beginning on that in that phase, these first few years, we've had such a tremendous focus on building up a really credible certification and uh, building standard and a certification system to back it up. Um, so in this coming year, we're gonna really start looking more into that forward kind of um, aspect of it, of getting on like a marketing director or a, a significant role in that. But in the meantime, thankfully, we have some great founders to lean on. And so with Patagonia, Bronner's and Rodale, um, they have done a really great job in educating their consumers about it. We've done some focus study uh, with consumers that I found really fascinating early on. And it's, as you mentioned, Leah, like this term was pretty new. And really, it wasn't just rolling off people's tongues. There's a lot of syllables in there in regenerative, right? And so early on, people really weren't saying it that much. And um, I think now you're hearing it everywhere. And it's become quite the buzzword, which is awesome in many ways, but it's also a concern because we don't want this to get watered down and turned into something like natural or um, a sustainable, like without any serious kind of credentials behind it or any real um, system behind it. So, um, you know, I think that part is really important is um, making sure to keep it meaningful. And for consumers, you know, they bring a whole suite of values with them when they are going and purchasing goods for their families, for their to, to consume, to put in their mouths or put on their bodies. And so, you know, there are many different things that people are looking for nowadays, whether it is, you know, strictly looking for organic or non-GMO or that they bring the, their cares about a social standard to um, looking for fair trade or 
the um, gluten-free or other types of labels. There's so many bugs on a product. Like there can be 10 different little icons that people have to kind of sift through and see what is meaningful here. And so I think it's really tough. It's a tough job to be a good conscientious consumer. And luckily we have like Gen Z and the millennials coming up and they're really smart shoppers and they use their phones a lot. They, they don't mind scanning QR codes and looking up a history of a product. And I think there's um, definitely uh, a less tolerance for inauthentic claims and um, you know, more willingness to look deeply into a product claim. Um, so I think you know, there's a lot of benefits there in kind of the upcoming generations of shoppers who are really driving a lot of this movement. But um, bottom line, trying to reduce these into like succinct talking points while at the point of sale is, is going to be very challenging. And um, you know, we haven't figured that out yet whatsoever. I, I'd say like our symbol, the rock symbol, will become very widely recognized. In fact, the Washington Post um, wrote a really great article right as we came out of our pilot program about the next, um, this like the next symbol, the gold standard for the earth is this symbol and this um, certified claim. So that was a proud moment for us. And um, we're gonna continue to build on that. Yeah, that's very exciting. Um, and I think, you know, I think Mary, you touched on this a little bit as well, as far as, accurate representation of the certification on products, um, working with the brands that are, are certified by both of your certifications. And I wonder if we could just dig a little bit deeper into, in, into how your organizations are trying to help build or, or restore consumer trust when it comes to certifications. I think you said it really well, Elizabeth, when you were talking about how consumers are having to sift through so many different labels. And that really relies heavily on them already having an understanding of what could be up to five or seven different um, certifications on a product. So I'd love to talk a little bit more in depth about kind of how your organizations are tackling that. In terms of uh, trust uh, for certifications, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, interestingly, when we did some market research, we found that more people trust our label than say that they've seen it. So there's definitely this latent trust um, in our label, even if people don't quite remember seeing it exactly, um, which is interesting. And I think it kind of speaks to a point that Elizabeth was talking about of um, the terms being co-opted. So fair trade is maybe slightly self-explanatory, maybe not at the end of the day, um, but it is something that maybe is being used in ways that we wouldn't use it or being applied to, to items that we wouldn't apply it to. Um, but in terms of trust, I think it really, it matters who we're partnering with. Um, fair trade is one of those labels where you need to meet the standards before you get the label. There are some other ones out there where if you make the commitment, um, then you can use the label. So I think that that's an important distinction for us. It's about actually meeting those standards in advance of using the label. Um, and then I think as well, it's just continuing to um, prove what we're trying to achieve um, and what the brands are trying to achieve by partnering with us. Um, I think at the end of the day as well, third party certifications are really important um, because they show some kind of consistency across brands, across product categories, um, across commodities. Uh, and, and it shows that there is, um, you know, some kind of standard setting behind it. We are um, part of the ICL network, which is like the certifier of certifiers. So they've looked at how we do things and they went, yep, this is, this is totally how we, you should be setting up a certification system. Um, and so when you see these labels pop up that are maybe um, created by a company themselves, we've been seeing this a lot in our industry recently where a large multinational will just go their own way and create their own label um, to kind of meet their own criteria, which on the one hand is good for achieving the goals that they particularly have in mind, but on the other hand is always inherently biased because the company's ultimate goal in many cases is to be profitable, um, which is sometimes in direct contrast to the well-being of workers um, or farmers, for example. Um, so we think that, you know, this kind of trend of some self-certification or in all honesty, just fake labeling as well. I've, I'm thinking in my mind, I won't say who, but there's a coffee company here locally that 
It's just the graphics team has just created a fair trade label that has no meaning or backing behind it in terms of any of the certification schemes out there. Um, you know, it really does uh, diminish uh, overall people's trust when they're not when they see all these labels, but they don't necessarily know which can be trusted. So that regularity and consistency across products, across brands, across commodities of seeing the same little um, logo, I think is really important to continuing to build that trust and authenticity. Absolutely. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, yeah. Um, for the Regenerative Organic Certified Standard, we recognize 14 different certifications out there that exist in three different pillars. Um, our certification is broken into a soil health, and land management, animal welfare, and then social fairness for farmers and farm workers. Those are the three pillars. And so we recognize different certifications within each of those three pillars. And, um, you know, we chose, the founders chose, you know, the, the highest bar, most rigorous standards to recognize and um, to eliminate any kind of duplication. We, we basically did a gap analysis between the ROC standard and each one of those other recognized certifications. So that would include NOP organic, EU organic, biodynamic, animal welfare approved, certified humane, Fair Trade USA, Fair Trade International, and so on. Um, it's a little complicated. It certainly made things cumbersome um, as far as like getting this, lifting this certification off the ground. But I think it, it was really important to, to acknowledge the hard work that had been done by all those other existing certifications and you know the many years of existence that um, they have had and established in across the world so you know that was one really big aspect to ours is building this credible certification the other part is um, the same as mary mentioned with um, iseal overseeing fair trade usa we followed iso standards um, the standards that most certifying bodies follow the iso 1765 and we have a really extensive certification body requirement process. And in order to be approved, you have to go through um, a really rigorous kind of checklist with our quality department quality manager. And so that ensures that we're bringing on the best of the best certifiers um, to do this work. And that we've got really well-trained auditors who have a great grasp of these topics and really demonstrated expertise in each of those pillars. Um, so, you know, that's, that's also, you know, as we have a very set a very high bar for farmers, we've also set a high bar for certifiers and auditors, making it therefore a bit harder to get um, a lot of, a lot of certified entities under our belt. But um, I'll be happy to share some of those metrics later if you'd like to hear about how many operations we have certified and how much ground we have covered because it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think that that sort of leads into something that that I've been thinking about as you two have been answering the, the previous question, which is like, how, what are your measures for success when it comes to these certifications? Is it, um, you know, mainly as many uh, producers and suppliers that you can, and products that you can get on board is, does, does your measure for success go beyond that? Um, and, and how much are you, how, how much, or how many resources and how much time and effort are you putting into the consumer education side of things? How could you measure, um, I guess, consumer trust and consumer knowledge of these certifications? And are you, you know, what efforts are you making around that? Is that clear? I like I can make it more clear. Okay, so there I, I see that Monica in the chat brought up that it's because of the complexity of these issues, which you you have both touched on. Um, consumer education and marketing plans, uh, the it's a really steep learning curve. Um, and so I'd love to know how much effort you're putting into the consumer education side of things, and then I will ask a separate question about measures for success. I can go first since mine's going to be a little Thank shorter you. than Mary's probably, um, is that we are we are really going to just begin that in 22. And so in the meantime, we have, as I said earlier, leaned, look to our founders, um, you know, Rodeo, Patagonia, Bronner's do a great job on that. And, and I just want to say there are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground, right? So you look at kiss the ground and their resources and their soil advocacy training and um, helping consumers understand what's really going on with the carbon cycle is huge. And I think it's really riveted a nation. And there's a lot of people now learning about the potential of agriculture to be 
to solve a problem rather than create our problems. And um, looking at Kiss the Ground resources is a, a really great way to go as far as helping people understand this very complex topic of just soil health and carbon sequestration. Absolutely. And I think it ties in well to Christina also has a great question in the chat, which she's asking, how well do you think CPGs are educating consumers on these standards and certifications? And I'd like to add to that and, and ask, do you think that that should be their role um, and that that CPGs and products and brands should be the ones taking on some of this consumer education? Yeah, if I can jump in here as well, and I'm going to go a little bit of a, a couple different directions here. I mean, first of all, I think that we are seeing a, a high growth in consumer education and um, attention, maybe is a better word for that, writ large. Even within uh, industries that I think are outside both of Elizabeth and my scope, such as car supply chains. If anybody has tried to buy a car recently, like I have, you have suddenly become very aware of how cars are made and about microchip shortages and all these types of things. Um, so I think now more than ever with the, the situation that we are in um, due to COVID, due to the climate crisis, due to all many different things, um, the racial justice reckoning that we're still going through in the United States in particular, many, many more people are sitting up and going, where's this coming from? Who's it benefiting? Mm -hmm. um, do I need it? Um, and really mm -hmm. looking hard at these types of things. So I think that we've only really just begin to scratch the surface of this kind of wave of consumer engagement and knowledge, um, let alone people reaching the end of Netflix and watching many different documentaries about where their food is coming from and being horrified about it as well. Yeah. Um, so I think that that will continue to um, percolate in people's minds and psyches. Um, what we found at Fair Trade is, you know, nobody wants to feel like they are purchasing something that's created with slave labor um, or purchasing something that is um, ruining the local environment. Uh, what is stopping people from understanding that mainly is the opaqueness of supply chains, which is often intentional, um, as well as to some extent a, a blinkering because there are so many issues in this world and there's only so much that anybody can come um, take into at one point in time. Um, Elizabeth mentioned the uh, propagation of fair trade in Europe in particular, and I think that that's a really interesting connection because in Europe, awareness of fair trade is in the 90th percentile. Like fairly every shopper is aware of fair trade and it is much more available than it is here in the United States. Um, and the marketing around fair trade in the 90s and O's was around this kind of like fair trade equals good, fair trade equals done, which I thought was kind of a connection to Monica's question there of, you know, check, I checked the box, it's all good, nothing to see here, kind of like go on with my business. Um, and as more and more consumers in Europe got educated to the like fair trade equals good, this is great kind of um, moniker, uh, when things started coming out about how fair trade is actually more of a, a process and a progress, um, there was a reduction in trust um, uh, kind of a, during that time because people were then going, wait, I thought we were all good here. I thought that we had the bases covered and now you're telling me that you know, there might be child labor on a fair trade certified farm. So what we've been doing as an organization is being a lot more upfront with the challenges that we face and how we are not perfect in this. Um, and that, you know, this is a, a process uh, to change global trade is not going to be achieved by just us either, um, that we are part of a, of a wider network um, trying to make this happen um, and being much more vocal about that. Sometimes that can lead to a little bit of hand wringing um, in the marketing team in particular, but I think that at the end of the day, for a consumer who's paying attention and, and wanting to engage in this, um, this not sort of like rose colored glasses approach is very much so appreciated because I think overall consumers are seeing through that like, don't look over here, everything's fine and dandy, don't worry about us. Um, so if we're able to have more discussions more openly and honestly across brands, NGOs, governments, academics, I think that we will get further together. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought up that the complexities of the supply chain and the necessity for transparency, not only for brands and for these large enterprise level CPGs, but also to, you know, to reflect on our own organizations and to ensure that we are continuing to 
to promote those same values that we are pushing for in the, you know, in these larger and, and really impactful organizations. And I think, you know, that is such a big part of how good's mission and trying to demystify and offer these deep insights on the ingredient level of really nuanced sustainability impacts. Um, and so I'm, I'm just glad that we're all, you know, having this conversation and able to hopefully further that, that, value and mission a little bit more. Um, there's a question here from Esther in the chat that I think is mostly um, for Elizabeth, but of course would love to hear from Mary's thoughts as well. Um, and and I, I, from my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Esther, but you're asking um, whether regenerative should move forward in a practice-based or outcome-based way. And I'd like to hear a little bit from you, Elizabeth, about how regenerative organic alliance sort of looks at that and how you're moving forward um, with your certification with those those in mind. Sure. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Esther. And um, I think, you know, first off, with the ROA, with the ROC program, it's, it's really a hybrid. It's very much practice based, but we are also collecting certain KPIs, key performance indicators from the farms. And we're also requiring soil testing once every three years. And um, there's been a long process of determining what type of soil indicators we needed to be testing for and what we could actually do with that data. Same with the KPIs. Um, but I think at the heart of it, um, really the difference between the practice-based and the outcomes-based, ours is practice-based, much like the organic is, and that there are certain practices put in place and that these are verifiable at the time of audit so we can have auditors go out and see this in place on the ground and you see what's happening and you can see, we've also got these three levels of bronze, silver, gold, and that there's a, a trajectory that we are incorporating this concept of continuous improvement. So you don't just get certified and then arrive there and never have to make any changes or do any better. It's like you build in the concept of continuous improvement over time, the farms will incorporate more regenerative practices. and. Um, we've really tested out the ROC framework in many different environments from, from um, annual system to perennial systems, from the tropics to the temperate climates, from grower groups to um, small farms to estates. And we tested out the different criteria throughout a long period of our pilot phase that um, NSF International was the program manager. And um, we did that in eight different countries um, with uh, a lot of learnings that we took in and then just had those deliberated among four different task forces before we made further changes to the framework. So I think the practices that we have captured in our framework are pretty good and generally seem to be applicable in most settings that we've gone to um, that it's, it's really worked. Um, there are some areas that we're having challenges for sure, especially around like the, this concept for um, tillage you know, tillage is bad, tillage is evil. Well, actually it's not, it's a really important tool that every farmer needs and that they have to be able to use some tillage in order to cultivate the ground and to plant um, seeds or plants. And, and um, so there's various ways that we've had to change our framework over time um, in response to that. Um, so, you know, I think it's the cool thing about the ROC framework is it's a living document and we will be changing it again, as we take in more feedback and we learn we're a very young program. And so there's a lot of learning still to be had. And, um, and then I would just add one other thing on the outcomes based, like there's certainly, um, you know, concern about an outcomes based certification that you just have to prove this outcome, but how you got there, we have no idea. And so, um, you know, depends on what you're testing for the outcome. Uh, I love savory. I love the savory program. I've seen the effects on the ground of what a savory hub can do in a, in a region with producers in that hub. And it's quite astonishing. And it's an outcome based certification program, but that um, doesn't include like all the incredible things that happen with the savory hub and the learning that, that goes along with that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. If I could just build on a small part of that too. Yeah. Um, our certification is unique in, in the fair trade realm in that we are 50% owned by the producers that my organization represents. So they have a voice in our general assembly, voting rights, all those types of things. So it is very much not a top down, but a collaborative, all of us together type of approach. Um, and something we had considered was this, you know, organic, which I know is obviously 
different to regenerative, um, but some of our farmers are organic and we discussed, you know, should we be pushing farmers to go organic um, as a way to better steward the land? And what we found is that, you know, farmers want to be able to make those decisions themselves and that it's a little bit paternalistic to be pushing um, any individual farmer in a direction that they don't necessarily feel is right for their land. So while our certification provides resources and support if a farmer does choose to go organic, it's very, very much so um, their individual choice for their farm, their community. Um, many farmers are, are farming um, in more indigenous ways anyway, um, so it is closer to the standard that I think that we all are hoping to see regardless, but it's very much um, a monetary decision as well. I mean, some of these choices are expensive, and when you're earning very little, it's not necessarily the best choice for you and your family. So I liked what it, um, Elizabeth was saying about that kind of like not necessarily um, completely banning one thing, which actually might be useful in, in different cases um, and talking to the people uh, who are doing the work. Um, and in, in our case, who we're representing um, to make sure that it is not a top down approach. I would love yeah. to add one other oh, thing, please. sorry, just um, as far as like, yeah, absolutely do not want to be um, these kind of global north paternalistic approach to any farmers, but also recognize that the use of pesticides in other countries oftentimes has no controls. We sell pesticides in other countries that are not allowed here anymore because they've been proven to be really damaging to human health and, and the instructions are written in language that people often don't speak. And so, um, you know, we at the Regenerative Organic Certified framework is based on organic and we really see um, that they those two terms must be intrinsically linked regenerative it has to be organic to be regenerative in our um, in the approach from the ROA and um, there's a lot of research coming too just on like the effects of, of say roundup or any other pesticides and herbicides that are used here in the US and their impacts on human health so I yeah, and I and I would add to that that we do have a banned list of pesticides, which most people think of fair trade as just um, you know workers' rights and things like that. But we we think it is holistic, and so we have a banned list as well, exactly for the reasons you just listed, Elizabeth. It's more harmful than it will be helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I I really appreciate your can both your candor when you're talking about the challenges when it comes to having a truly you know like a comprehensive. Uh, certification. It's super difficult. And I know that you're both really proud of the work that you've done and the certifica certifications that you have, as you should be. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, as we talk about organic to regenerative and sort of this ever evolving understanding of what it means to be sustainable or regenerative or fair labor, um, what would your ideal impact label look like? Like if you were, if you were at, you know, you're at the grocery store or you're at the um, mall. Does anyone go to the mall anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but if you're, you know, picking up your favorite product, what information would you hope to see? Or, you know, what, what do you hope the next step for your own certifications might be? Um, yeah, I can go first. I'm going to actually jump on something Elizabeth said before um, with Gen Z and QR codes. I think that that's what I'd like to see some kind of, um, you know, changeable, informative uh, labeling. I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon necessarily, but I think that um, being able to show not only where you've been, but where you're going and in more, more close to real time, I think will be very important moving forward. Um, at the moment, you know, obviously packaging is a little bit more static and stuck in, in the present day, which often is dealing with data from the past. Um, so I would love to be able to to have more of that. Maybe that's just like my nerdy data side coming out here with that. Um, but in general too, I think, you know, I, we've been very curious about this at Fair Trade for a long time, considering that one of our main manifestations to most people is a label on products. And with the proliferation of labels and just more and more and more of them um, and more brands needing to make choices of, you know, well, do I include vegan and regenerative and fair trade and carbon neutral? Like, what should I be including here of all different stripes? Um, if there will almost be like a wave backwards um, to less labeling um, and what does that look like for products, cert the certifications behind the product too. 
I don't have an answer for that necessarily, but I think that we can all agree that we're not going to see packaging where half of it is taken up by labels. But saying that, um, we did some focus groups a few years ago in Chicago, and um, I was behind the mirror, you know, and uh, one of the women uh, held up a bag of a popular brand of more natural popcorn and was like, this has got to be good because it's got all these things on it. So I bet it's healthier, you know, so I think that we're still in that zone of more labels equal better right now. But I can see a future coming where um, that is not going to be ultimately sustainable for, for, for packaging, for brands and for consumers. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so the, the tie between um, a lot of labels and health is really interesting. I don't know. I don't know if that's something that we want to dig into on this particular call, but I think it's something that we're seeing come up so much more often. And especially when we're looking in the alternative protein space, mm -hmm. um, these ties that consumers are sort of automatically making. Um, so I thought, I think it's interesting that that was something that came up in your focus group, but Elizabeth, did you have something? It sounded like you had uh, a thought to, to voice there. Yeah, I just wanted to agree first with Mary. I love that idea of a QR code and it shows like where they've been and where they're, how they've come along, how they've progressed or changed and improved. Um, but for me, I was thinking about um, this concept of an ecological footprint. And mm. I don't know if people have heard of that, but it's, um, it's a really interesting way to assess like how much nature, how much resources something requires and like it, it portrays it graphically as far as like a footprint in the carrying capacity of the earth. And uh, like the last time I checked it, I think like the way um, the US consumes resources as like globally compared to global citizens, like we are consuming, we would need five more planet earths to just satisfy the way we consume goods here in the US. And so it's a really interesting way to um, graphically capture that and show it in a physical kind of manifestation of um, a footprint. Um, but of course, I, I would be remiss not to say, like, I want to see the rock label as the one that everybody grabs. So um, I'll, have to, I'll have to say that. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder, so I'm thinking a lot about, um, I think that we, we tend to have uh, people on the call who are either product developers or are in sustainability departments at CPG companies, for example. And I wonder if you could speak to um, sort of the business incentives and the business case, if someone is an advocate that within an organization like that, and they want to, they want to advocate for getting the ROC certification or the fair trade certification, um, you know, what, what might be an argument that you could suggest to them uh, to take to the, to the higher ups, um, to make sure that they they are able to go through with getting certified. Yeah, for Rock, it would be that this checks all the boxes, really. And so it kind of eliminates the need for having 10 seals on a packet and, and unifies it all under one roof, one under. Mm -hmm. Um, and for fair trade, I mean, we've done some research on this, and I know other organizations have too. In our research, we studied um, a chocolate bar, a bag of coffee, and a banana in particular, since those are some popular fair trade items, and found that consumers are willing to pay more for fair trade certified products. If anybody's interested um, in that study, I can definitely send it to you. So just pop your contact details into me uh, in a private chat. Um, we've also seen that, uh, I think it's in the confectionery industry in particular, National Confectioners Association put out a study recently that they did that um, the product categories that have been leading the growth are in the sustainability field. Mm -hmm. um, fair trade being included in that as are many other types of certifications, but the most growth is coming from this small pocket of sustainable products. So I think that for any brand manager out there, you have to be paying attention um, to some kind of sustainability um, and some kind of sustainability that you can communicate to your shoppers um, in terms of your product mix. Um, in terms of fair trade in particular, you know, we don't work across all product categories. Um, all commodities uh, or all localities. So I saw, for example, that there are some um, uh, like ranchers in the chat and everything. Uh, so we don't work in animal products, for example. So you're not going to see fair trade beef anytime soon. Um, but if it is a product commodity that we work in, 
definitely uh, brands are coming to us, not only looking for the uh, revenue bump that comes with being fair trade certified often, or getting into um, different retailers, or like I said, getting that climate pledge friendly badge from Amazon, which does lead um, to more visibility to customers, um, but also trying to tick off some of their other goals uh, in terms of sustainability. So for example, Unilever um, launched an initiative that by 2030, they wanted to have living wages across all of their employees and all of their supply chains. And so by partnering with fair trade and some of the commodities that they source, they can work actively towards that goal. So it partly depends on the overarching goals of the organization, but for many brand managers who are being judged on a more narrow set of criteria, um, that revenue increase is very important as well. Yeah, definitely. And I, and both of you have touched on this point um, as far as when consumers have the information and it's made easy for them to understand, they will, and this has been certainly the case in How Goods Experience in our retail um, attributes where consumers can see this product is good, better, best. The sales in those re retailers for the products that are rated well are substantially higher. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful statistic to bring into that sort of business incentive conversation. Um, and something else we've touched on a little bit that I'd like to, to ask you both about, and, and this comes from sort of the Global North perspective, um, and the regenerative and sustainability movement has certainly been criticized, and, and for good reason, for being largely white, and a lot of the practices, especially within regenerative, are coming from indigenous um, viewpoints and from indigenous tradition. Um, and I wonder as we're going forward and trying to be less extractive of those communities, are there any requirements within your certifications about how much money goes back to the producer? So if someone is becomes certified fair trade or becomes certified regenerative organic, um, are there any requirements within that that says in order to be certified a certain percentage of of this of money or profit has to go back to the producer? Yeah, I can take that one first. And um, considering that fair trade feeds into the regenerative um, standard, uh, this, this at least will give a, a small window into what we do. Um, so what we do is we don't do anything in terms of the percentage of the sales of the product because we wanna make sure that producers are paid when they sell their goods at the instance of sale. Um, so we have two pricing mechanisms um, to do that. We've got one which is called the fair trade minimum price, which is just considered a floor price for when the bottom falls out of a market. You know, we're dealing with commodity markets where there's like future trading on the stock exchange, like coffee future trading. So it's a, less about, you know, the actual cost of producing the good and more about investors in many cases. And so for a very long time, for example, the price of coffee was hovering around a dollar a pound, which is just not what is needed in order to produce it, considering that a lot, much of the coffee grown around the world is done so on small family farms of just a few acres versus on um, plantation farms. So um, we have a minimum price for our commodity goods, um, which buyers need to meet if the market price is lower than that currently. If the market price is higher, pay the market price. That's happening right now in vanilla, um, where the price of vanilla is actually higher than silver. Um, and that is due to climate change, um, the costs of farming it, um, and the conditions that producers are facing due to like recent cyclones and um, crops being decimated. So in that case, you know, you're not paying the, the fair trade minimum price. Um, in addition to the price, a buyer must pay the fair trade premium on top of that. And what happens with that is it's put in a uh, fund that is managed by the cooperative. Um, we, we require all of our farmers to form into cooperative because we think that there's more strength in numbers versus working individually. And then the cooperative democratically decides on how to use that funding. So they could decide on building a road, um, investing in business supplies and farming equipment, scholarships for kids, or honestly, just a payout. I think that that's a really important thing um, that sometimes in the West, we, we struggle to wrap our heads around when we have these models like a one-for-one -one Tom's shoe model. It implies that someone needs shoes when they might really just need money. Mm -hmm. um, and so very much so giving farmers the ability to decide on what to do 
with that money themselves. And by having it democratic as well, we've seen that women farmers are able to have a, a greater voice in their communities, whereas maybe they didn't have that before. Um, so those are the two pricing mechanisms that fair trade uses, which again are paid at the instance of the first purchase so that farmers are not, um, you know, waiting for a product to be sold in a local supermarket in order to get a percentage back, which is often just just too long um, to wait for them to be able to reinvest in their farms and communities. Wow, that's really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit more in depth about that model, because I think it's so interesting. And, and especially I know, and I know that you mentioned before, sort of keeping in mind this kind of paternalistic idea of what people need and that one to one model when, you know, ultimately, a lot of times, farmers, they just they need money, they need to be pay, paid fairly for their products. And, um, you know, if if the only way that they're able to be paid is doing it in a way that is not certifiable, then that's the way that they're they're going to do it. Um, Elizabeth, did you have anything that you wanted to to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Mary, for explaining that. That's it is helpful, I think, to set that stage and look at all the different social certifications have some form of system like similar to that, where there's money that is and resources being driven back to the farmers in various ways. Um, so that's definitely something that um, one of the reasons we recognize certain fairness certifications. Um, for the ROC criteria, we have a whole section that's it's quite different from most certifications. There's a buyer's criteria. And so brands and buyers who are able to use that ROC label on front of pack have to show that they are paying premiums, paying above premiums, that they are signing long-term contracts with the farmers and that they are transparent about those contracts. And so that's something quite different. It's quite a departure. And it's still um, admittedly a little hard for us to um, kind of incorporate that because that doesn't get asked at the farm level by the auditor of the farmers. It needs to be asked at the buyer level. So um, we're still really working on that different aspect of it, but I think it's really important. And so far what I've experienced um, are the brands who are jumping on board and reaching out to us to try and get rock crops to make a CPG with a rock logo on it. They want to do that. They recognize the fragility of their supply chains and they want to support them and they want to be able to to kind of deepen those relationships. And um, in fact, tonight I'm having a meeting and dinner with Vic Gallant from Gallant International, who you mentioned earlier, Mary. And this brand is just amazing. And this these this family behind this brand is so committed. He comes to me and he's like, Elizabeth, I think you need to charge more of a percentage. And like he's coming up with these other ways that he sees we need to do it to drive resources back to the farmers. And so I just love the fact that we've got brands like that working with us and reaching out to us and telling us, hey, you should, you should charge more. I've got brands who are willing to pay that. And um, that, that's really exciting to me. And I think really shows the kind of brands who are gonna be um, carrying that rock logo. And so, yeah, we've, as I've said a couple of times, we're still a very young program and a long way to go, but um, you know, we, we've definitely got some great um, ideas and, and um, different ways that we're going to be approaching this. And then I also really um, importantly do not want to let go of that first part of your question about indigenous and BIPOC farmers and the kind of racial reckoning that we are going through here in the U.S. Thank God it's about time. Um, and, you know, for that, I, I do think there's been, you know, it's, it's this regenerative movement um, has certainly been driven by a lot of white faces and that it's um, really important to get more perspectives in at the table. And we've, um, I'm really excited. We just got a day Romero Briones to join our board and um, she leads First Nations People um, Program on Sustainable Food and is an incredible voice uh, of wisdom to help share that perspective with us. And we have more coming in and others on our, our different committees, but it's really important to continue to embrace that and broaden this movement and um, bring those voices in. And, um, yeah, so thanks for asking that as well. We, we do have a program where we'll, we have, um, we'll waive the fees for any kind of marginalized farmers, historically kind of marginalized farms in regions, um, especially like in the South of the US um, and where we'll just waive the whole ROA fees. And then we have a cost share program that can offset the fees that the certifiers needs to charge to do the audits. And um, so that's our small way of trying to encourage this. Um, Amazing. Yeah, I mean, the work that both of you are doing is just so inspiring. Um, I wanna give everybody sort of a, a 
a four minute warning. So it, in the audience, if you have any questions that you'd like to pop in into the chat, this is kind of your last opportunity. So I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. Um, I also wanna say thanks very much. And I wanna direct both the speakers to a, a, a few very um, lovely and complimentary comments that are in the chat. So I'll, we'll also save it so that you guys can take a look later since I know we're otherwise engaged at the moment. Um, but I wanna say thanks very much to both of you and thank you to the audience for engaging in such a meaningful way. Um, it's been very, very cool to talk with both of you and get your perspective and, and the opportunity to just learn a little bit more about your strategies and, and your passion for your organizations is, is a real treat. Um, I'd love to give you both an opportunity to either talk about something that you're excited about that you'd like to draw the audience's attention to as far as your organizations uh, coming up in the next, you know, in the near future or, you know, in the, in the longer term, um, and just kind of, a, a, a you know, maybe wrap up a, a finishing thought um, to kind of close us out unless there are any other uh, questions in the chat. I think we just have more, more compliments and comments coming in. Go ahead, Mary. Sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about um, just so many things in the future right now. Um, some of the things, though, I think are, you know, double-edged sword, they're challenges as well. Um, and as I said before, you know, the fact that consumers are really engaging more with the supply chains um, and, and where their products are coming from is exciting, but also, you know, it's going to be painful as well in many cases as, as, as these kinds of um, shields are lifted um, from people's and they can see what is, what is actually happening. I think something that struck me about this conversation that I don't have an answer to, but I just, I feel like this group would be um, receptive to, is we've been talking a little bit about data, we've been talking about information and impact, and something that um, I think is concerning in the industries that we work in is that data and impact and, and those kinds of measurements often only flow one way. We keep asking the producers, the farmers for this information. We keep putting more requirements on them for more monitoring, more auditing, more, 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 totally. without necessarily the resources to do that. Um, just the expectation of maybe some kind of payoff from them of being able to sell their goods at a higher price. Um, there are so many new technologies out there capturing information. I mean, I myself talked about a QR code with impact data on it. You know, there's definitely this, this desire for data consumption and information. Like if we could only know more, then it would be better. And it just doesn't tend to flow the other way. Um, how many brands are reporting to farmers on their impact and their data? And I think that there's um, another imbalance of power there with where information is flowing, who's requiring it and who cannot necessarily um, ask of it. So I don't have an answer for that here, but I feel like this group would be respective um, or receptive rather um, to just the, um, disconnection that that provides and maybe helping to provide some solutions into the future. I think we've got some really great minds on the chat um, and would just be love to get to the bottom of this issue. And I think that that will lead to more equality overall. That's brilliant, Absolutely. Mary. I love that, the channeling the information back to the farmers. It's so true. We keep asking more and more, it gets put on the farmers' backs. And so that's one of the reasons I love that the ROC framework is really brand driven in a way, brands pay more, brands are expected to really change behaviors in that. And, um, and that's, I think, pretty ingenious of the founders of the ROC uh, standard. Um, so, you know, you had asked in some of the questions leading up to this, Leah, about like some of our biggest challenges. And I would just wanna say like for us, it's time and capacity. We have a really small team. We've had tremendous interest. We have fielded uh, f about 500 phone calls and meet wow. actual meetings with not just a phone call, but like set meetings with groups of people from different brands around the world. It's busy. And like that takes one person's dedicated time. And then we have our certification specialists helping the farmers go through the application process and get them onboarded and assigned to a certifier. And then we do all the training of the certifiers and their auditors. So it's a lot on a tiny little team. So patience is required, but the good news is like, by now, this year, we've gotten about 180 applications in the queue. Because of COVID, we had a lot of holdups and getting out and auditing, but we have now certified, I'd say probably just over 40 operations 
And last count, that represented 26,900 smallholders, 152,000 acres, and 88 different types of crops. So we're doing okay. We're getting out there. And, and next year is going to be really off the hook because we have some really amazing certifiers um, getting approved and doing this work with us in partnership. So it's going to be a big year for us, 22. Very excited about that. And um, I think we're probably out of time. I, uh, I want to say one other thing I'm excited about, though, is... Um, on our website soon, we are going to have a rock, rock search directory, so you can go and look for farmers that are certified and brands that have been approved and licensed. And of those, we have about 20 right now. That's so awesome. that's incredible. That's well, I, Lou, we should definitely be in touch about how good supplier database, because I think that there's some exciting work we could do together there. I want to say thank you so much again to you both. I can't wait to see the work. That you, I wish we had another hour to talk. I feel like I didn't even get to half of my questions. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to everyone who is a part of this community. Um, I really look forward. I'm so glad this was the innovation series session that closed out our year. Um, I look forward to, to many more, and I hope that I'll see you all in future sessions. Enjoy your holidays. Have a safe and healthy new year. Um, and yeah, thanks again, everyone. Thank you bye so bye. much. What yeah. a great audience. And shout out to Paul right there, Paul in Denmark. Um, or Paul, hey, Paul. Lots of uh, <laughs> great comments there. So thank you very much. Yeah. Have a great holiday, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Everybody, thank bye. you. Thanks, Leah.